Hello again and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We're glad you could join us for another hour of good gardening. We'd love to hear from you, so if you do have a question about your lawn or your garden, give us a call. 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 800-676-5446. If you'd like to send us a picture via email for a future show, our address is byf at unl.edu. Attach those pictures as JPEGs. Do not forget to tell us where you live or I will have to ask you that question. You can also follow Backyard Farmer during the week on our social media offerings. That includes Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. So, Jonathan, it looks like a cat face as we decided, but it's not, right? <laughs> no, I thought we could talk about ticks tonight. So I brought one here in my little vial. It's a very elusive tick, unfortunately. I don't know that it's going to show up very well for television, but it is tick season. People going out doing gardening are going to encounter some of the ticks wandering around and trying to give you a nice big bear hug and climb aboard and dip, burrow their tongue into your skin so they can drink your blood. <laughs> it's a very delightful process that they perform. So we have several different species of tick here in Nebraska. This is the American dog tick. It's the most common. There's also the Lone Star tick, which is common along river corridors and in wooded areas. We're not a big state for the, the black-legged tick, the deer tick. It's not a known tick in this area. So that means we don't necessarily have to worry about Lyme disease here, but we do have to worry about some of those other diseases like tularemia and Rocky Mountain spotted fever or the dreaded red meat allergy. So if you want to protect yourself, from some of these little critters like I brought in my photograph here. Uh, you can wear some repellents on your skin, the same things that you would use for mosquitoes. These are not falling out of trees, they're hanging out on blades of grass. And I have a nice picture of that. Thank Jim Kalish for these photographs as well. <laughs> and this one, he's waiting just right there to give you a big hug as you walk by and climb <laughs> aboard. If you have that repellent on, something like a DEET or even a permethrin, then they're less likely to be able to survive on you. You should always do a tick check as well when you go inside and remove anything before they end up like this picture where they're engorged. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> this one's really gross. Uh, these ticks have been feeding on somebody for quite some time. They can be on you for anywhere between two to four days and they're drinking blood that whole time. The longer they're on, the more likely you are to get a disease. So get them off as quick as possible and you won't have to worry about that. And doesn't your skin just crawl? Ticks are the <laughs> only thing that creeps me out. Matt always says I pick my favorite things all the time, but these are the only ones I don't like. I, I don't like ticks. Yeah, they're right up there with spiders yeah. in my book. Oh, no, they're spiders worse. are such... They're worse. <laughs> <laughs> they're worse. Okay, Matt, you, uh, you have a couple of the weeds that uh, we identified kind of, sort of, incorrectly with Bill last week, and you brought the samples. Yes, and I sometimes run into the same problem. If somebody sends a picture, they're right. kind of difficult to see what's what, especially when you don't have a really high resolution and you can zoom in and see what's going on. Uh, but I just kind of wanted to explain which, uh, some of the characteristics of the two. I have henbit and ground ivy. And one of the easiest ways to tell if you have these weeds, if you take your weed and you just twist it in your finger and you smell it, it smells like a minty flavor. And that, that's a telltale sign that it's ground ivy. Uh, just looking at them, they kind of have the same characteristics. Uh, generally, henbit is more of an upright growth and kind of a bunch, whereas ground ivy will spread along the ground and be more of a prostrate growth pattern. But in some, in some cases, they're both upright and you really can't tell what they are. Um, henbit has kind of a whirl shape on the top and ground ivy really doesn't have that whirl. It's more of an alternate leaf. Uh, and there's some instances where henbit has the alternate leaf, so that's not perfect either. Uh, henbit also has uh, small hairs on the leaves on top, whereas uh, ground ivy is smooth and kind of shiny on top. So those are two different things that you can look at. Uh, but the easiest one is just to you know squish it between your fingers, and if you have that minty smell, since ground ivy is in the mint family, uh, it has kind of a potent smell. Even if you're mowing over the area, you'll notice that it's a pretty strong, potent smell, uh, and uh, Henbit is an annual, so it's going to die out uh, when the summer comes, and ground ivy will stick around as long as you let it be. And henbit actually looks a little more lobed. The leaves are a little fluffier almost. Yeah, they. I mean, they're. Yeah. They're, there's a little bit of different characteristics in the leaves themselves. I don't know if you can zoom in on this, but uh, yes, there is. There's some differences, but they can be difficult just by looking at a picture, uh, especially if you don't have a good resolution on it. 
All right. Can thank you, Matt. Up? Yeah, go ahead. Smell it up. <laughs> you smell it stick. won't burrow into you. <laughs> it won't burrow. Yeah. yeah. Mint. Yeah. Yeah. Minty? I see. There you go. Yeah. Snack away. Yeah. Okay. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> in your, in your water. <laughs> okay, Kyle, not so pretty of an African fire. Yeah, mine does not smell near as near as nice as Matt's sample does. <laughs> um, so in case anyone has actually come by the uh, plant and pest diagnostic clinic in the past five or six years, they've probably seen this African violet um, up on our receptionist Debbie's desk. And this violet has had a long life, but a couple of weeks ago, it started to wilt very quickly. Um, over the course of just a couple of days, it went from looking great to this nice kind of water-soaked um, or kind of squishy petioles down, down near the base. And as we move further up the, further up the, up the petiole, things get a little bit better, not near as squishy. And that is um, how far the, the disease has actually moved up the moves, moved up the petiole. And so this, unfortunately, this uh, th this plant has Phytophthora. It's actually is Latin for plant destroyer. So one of a kind of one of my favorite That's pathogens. Good, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, unfortunately, with Phytophthora, that a it's a soil borne um, a soil borne root rot. It's activated and with moisture. And so we have had a little bit of moisture this year. And so I would expect that there's a lot of Phytophthora going on out there, um, especially when we have some warmer temperatures and the roots are actively growing and the soil saturated, those spores actually swim through the soil to get to the root, to get to the plant roots. And if it is just a, um, your annual, um, annual beds or in your garden, not a whole lot you can do with Phytophthora. So I'd just recommend roguing it out and trying to dry out that area and then try planting something different next year, hopefully something that has uh, that is resistant to to some of these root rots. So that is a former African violet. This is a former African violet. We have a, we do have four cuttings going, so hopefully we'll have African violet version 2.0 soon. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Kyle. All right, Elizabeth, your sample is what? My sample actually smells better than Kyle's and I think better than Matt's too. Um, but we have a couple of different plants in here and these are really great plants because they like it in that moist to kind of shaded environments. And they're a little bit different than we think of when we think of the hostas or um, the Solomon seal or some of those other shade loving plants. But what we have is we have this Carex. Um, the Carex kind of looks like a, a funky grass. This is the long beak sedge, and it's a cool one because it's about 12 to 18 inches tall. It has these awesome looking seed heads on here, which makes you think it's a grass, um, but it's just tricking you. It's really not. And it is one of those clump formers, and it does really well. The other one that smells very good is the phlox right here, and that's the native woodland phlox. And it's also gonna be about that 12 to 18 inches tall or so, very fragrant. Um, this was a native one, and again, it likes the similar conditions that, that um, Carex is gonna like, that kind of moist to wet part shade kind of environment. So two very different plants that we can use in the in the shaded areas. Excellent, and it sort of puts nutsedge to shame, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> Does it spread like nutsedge? No. Oh, that's good. Clump former. <laughs> <laughs> All right, first picture questions come to you, Jonathan. Bug time. <laughs> so this is a Butler County viewer. She has a, a dogwood uh -huh. that has branches that have not leafed out. She did have the full picture, but clearly this is <laughs> The issue, she thinks it's scale and it's about a 20 year old dogwood. What do we think on this one? She got it right. That is oyster shell scale that we're looking at here. It's a pretty prodigious scale. It can feed on lots of different plants. It looks like an oyster, hence the name. Uh, in terms of control, the crawlers are gonna be coming out here soon in this part of the country. So if you wanted to wait and spray a permethrin or pyrethroid type product when the crawlers are active here at the end of this month, you could wait to do that. You could also try to go out and do a horticultural oil right now. If the plant is already kind of springing up though, you don't want to do a dormant oil or you will burn those parts of the plant that are green. But those would be the two control strategies here. You could also scrub it off. If you've got a brush that you really like to use for that, you can go out there and just scrub them right off the plant. All right, and you have another couple of pictures that are actually a Japanese um, maple yeah. that is really doing pretty poorly. And you know, they do have lenticels, but is this 
I'm this not, white stuff has shown up. I'm not seeing anything here that seems insect related. Uh, right. I looked really closely at this plant a few different times. The only thing I can think of in this second image that we're looking at here, there does look to be like possible cicada damage there, those mm. slits that we see cut in there, but that could also be from hail or a few other things. I'm just not seeing anything here that leads me to think there's an insect problem. This tree just could be suffering from a lot of other problems. Right, it's a former tree. Probably. It's a former tree? <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I would Current think that was, yeah, that's, that's not oh, a very no. good looking uh, Japanese yeah. maple. Yeah. All right, so you have uh, actually the same weed from two different people on this one. Right. The first is Nor Norfolk, and they wonder what this weed is, and he sent this picture before it flowered, and thank you for putting in the quarter for a little bit of scale. And then he sent one after he actually did a little bit of wheat control on it, but you can see the flowers and a little bit of the seed head. Yep. And then we have a third picture from a third viewer. Yeah, that one's the easy one to yeah. figure out. <laughs> so what is it and how do you control this? Well, it's a, it's a winter annual and it's shepherd's purse. And you can tell, especially by the seeds, they're kind of a triangular shape, almost like a purse. That's where it gets its name. Um, so they would have come up last fall, late, uh, late fall and through the winter and now they're bolting up and they're seeding out really quickly uh, so you can mow them off and then within a couple of days they're already shooting out more seed heads so uh, controlling them now is typical to any other broadleaf weed you're going to use some 2,4-D based products uh, be careful around any of the other susceptible plants uh, but that works well for those the better time to do it if you would have done it in the fall when it's in that little rosette uh, it's not bolting out and that takes care of them and then you're not running the risk of any other plants to damage. So it's, it's pretty simple to control in the fall and the spring. It's not because it's growing so fast. Uh, it's putting all its efforts into producing seed and sometimes you don't get as good a control because it's, it's not absorbing that chemical into the plant. All right, and with wet, wet weather, it's pretty easy to pull if yeah, you don't ever exactly. any of them. Sometimes you got fields of them, and if you have a yeah, couple in your garden here and there, then yeah, pull them out. They're pretty shallow, fibrous root system. All right, thanks, Matt. All right, Kyle. Mm -hmm. Several questions that look like this after the rain that we had in the warm weather. Is Christmas lights left up in the trees? <laughs> Orange ones, Orange perhaps ones, yeah. from Halloween. <laughs> Juicy. Whoa. Juicy, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, it's, um, actually was able to uh, to bring some of this in myself, but that is cedar apple rust. Um, one of our showiest, really showiest um, plant diseases. It always makes a great a great demo, but it is one of uh, one of the rusts that um, in the spring it will. Um, send out these kind of orange telial horns as we call them and these are full of spores um, the, as as wind and rain hits these spores they're blown onto apple trees or any rosacea uh, ros rosaceous plants nearby and they can form a rust on those um, on the apple trees and so as far as damage to your junipers probably not going to do a whole lot to them um, after repeated years of um, repeated years of infection there may be some branch dieback, but overall they don't really don't harm the junipers. If you have apple trees um, and you're wor worried contr about controlling the rust on the apples or your crab apples, these the, sh the sign of these horns means that now is the time to spray um, any sort of fungicide if you if you did want to control the fungus, um, the this, the rust on your apples. All right, excellent, and that is one of the biggest but, ones I've ever seen. Yeah, it's uh, we have some have some great specimens here on campus. Luckily, <laughs> perfect. All right, Elizabeth, this is actually a Grand Island viewer. She has uh, old lilac bushes, grew quite tall. They cut them back. They didn't bloom last year as they would expect. This year, only a few flowers, and then most of the leaves actually look sort of this curling edges, turning blackish brown. Any idea on this one? So when we take a look at this sample, this this one that we have up is the perfect one because the only ones that are turning black or discolored is the newest most growth, which with some of the cold temperatures we've been having, that newest growth is the most succulent and it is going to get hit by those cold temperatures. <coughs> mm -hmm. So that would be my first thought is we're probably looking at those cold temperatures and frost damage possibly, which we could get more tonight, my friends. Mm -hmm. um, so be on the lookout for more damage similar to that down the road. It's not going to affect the plant. Um, just leave it in there if you want. If you really want to prune it out, you could, but I just leave it in and let it do its thing. All right, and, and unfortunately, you're right. Colder weather ahead tonight. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, well, you know, growing plants in the shade can really be somewhat of a challenge. This is especially true as our trees grow taller as they mature, casting shade on areas that were previously in full sun. So here to tell us more about some native Nebraska wildflowers that thrive in the shade is Extension Assistant Mary Jane Froge. When you have trees in the landscape, they're always growing and maturing. So this gives you a great opportunity to plant some shade plants that are native, or you can also add non-native and bulbs to the area. Some of my favorite native plants that bloom in the spring are Spring Beauty. It's an amazing little plant. It's one of the earliest to bloom. It's got beautiful pink flowers and it is um, really attractive to pollinators, especially since it's one of those early blooming plants. Another one that does really well that's native is Virginia bluebells. It's got this beautiful, incredible blue color, and what's real fun about them is each year when I go out to look for them, I find them in another location. They seem to move around the garden, and so I never know where they're gonna pop up. Another plant that's more of a foliage plant is Solomon seal. This plant is also native and does a great job of adding uh, different textures to your shade garden area. Another plant that blooms early is Dutchman Britches. This is a really cute plant that's got uh, a, a real unique flower. It's related to the bleeding heart and it blooms earlier and then you've got the bleeding heart that comes in later. We have another unique plant that um, is a spring blooming and it's called Trillium. This one I just have gotten established so it hasn't bloomed yet, but it's got a really neat leaf and so you can really pick it out easy in the garden. One of my favorite plants from my childhood is violets. As a kid, you'd collect them. I really like them in the garden in the, sh in the shade. There are um, the traditional ones that you see, the purple, but there's also white and yellow. They add some color to your landscape. Other plants that you can do are spring bulbs. Bulbs are great. They fill in um, those bare areas in the spring. So you've got crocus, you have daffodils, snowdrops are another one that's real early that are one of my favorites. So there's so much to pick from. As your landscape matures, your trees get taller and you get more shade. Instead of cutting back the trees or limbing them up, you know, embrace that and see it as an opportunity to add different plants to the landscape. Getting some color into those shady areas does take a little bit of thought and some creativity. Trying some of the native wildflowers really does help solve that problem and, you know, just let them go and naturalize and it's way <laughs> cool. It's so much easier. Let it grow. Let it grow. All right. So we'll let, we'll let this one grow too okay. because this is a, this is a first of these, this year, but we will have more to come. Tiny red bumps all over the maple tree. Oh, those are nerds. Yeah, <laughs> <you know. laughs> uh, this is the maple bladder gall, and it's made by mite. It's on those maple leaves. It is not going to impact that tree, so there's no treatment that's needed. It's just kind of an entomological curiosity out there. All right, perfect. So, and this is silver maple is the worst, okay. usually. All right. So then we have this interesting beastie, yeah. and we have a couple of pictures of this one, and it, what is it? These are cocoons. They look <laughs> like my actual favorite insect, the Cecropia <laughs> moth. Uh, this one is a, one of the largest silk moths that we have here in North America. They have really big cocoons. I think in the email they said these are about two inches long. Right. So they're quite large and in charge. When they come out, they're a big red, orange, and brown kind of furry moth. It's very beautiful. It's the largest moth we have here in North America. The other option is it could be a polyphemus moth. The only way to know is to watch what comes out here in the next few weeks. Which will be fabulous. It would be awesome. To Either see. way. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. All right. Since you had samples, yeah. we have three different pictures. See if we can get them right. And bit <laughs> <laughs> or ground ivy. So this is actually a near Crofton and she's wondering if this is something that she wants in her landscape. It's a ground cover and it's quite dainty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It looks it looks like ground ivy to it me. Does. That one's small and when I looked at close into it, it that's that's what that's I'm pretty guessing. Much it ground is. Ivy. I don't know. If if it's in a shaded area, you might not get grass to grow there. Right. So if you want something green, mm -hmm. let it be. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause it'll stay short and you won't be mowing it off and it'll be green ground cover. So that's 
And if you want to get rid of it, then um, there's a couple products. Ones that contain Triclopyr are the best uh, because you need multiple modes of action and fall is the best time generally to get rid of it completely two applications. All right, and I think our second picture here is Mm, henbit ground ivy one yeah, or the other <laughs> i had a really difficult time <laughs> telling what it is it looks like bolt almost but yeah. it, it's upright growth so i would lean towards henbit but yeah. um the leaves almost look like it's ground ivy so or uh, if you were to just smush that between your fingers and smell it because <laughs> <laughs> even the flowers look similar on yeah. these two so um same control methods but if it's hand bit, it's probably gonna die out here in the summer when the, we get hotter weather. All right, I think we have a third one that's a little bit hard to tell also. Yeah, that Very one pixelated. looks yeah, more like the ground ivy because it of its prostrate growth. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's pretty colorful when it's blooming. So mm -hmm. I don't know if it's if it's in the shade again, I don't know, You're not, you might not get grass to grow there anyway. So it's up to you if you wanna control it. All right. And then one thing to mention, if it is under trees, triclopyr is actually uh, kind of a brush killer. So mm -hmm. if you're going under trees with triclopyr, you might want to be careful on some of those smaller ones because it can, it can affect the, the roots and actually kill the tree. All right. In other words, let it be a shady ground yes. cover. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Matt. All right, so we have a couple of fungi of Ooh. sorts for you, Kyle. The first- Fungi for a fun guy. Oh, cute. <laughs> so this is a Bennington viewer, and she found this growing in the mulch. <laughs> and this is, she, this is her first picture of this, and then I think there's a second okay. one. And, and she's wondering whether she can plant flowers in this area and whether she needs to get rid of the mulch or treat it with something. She doesn't really want to spread whatever it is. Yeah, so that, um, that look, to me, it looks like, uh, looks like slime mold mm -hmm. is what's going on, and that's really common whenever any time that we have a lot of moisture um, you'll find it all all over uh, all over mulch piles typically it will they'll show up over overnight and then they'll be there for a couple of days once the weather dries out they'll dry out and and disappear so it's really nothing to worry about with those just kind of enjoy the extra color on your mulch right now okay and then this is also a norfolk viewer your third one and she uh she found these in a flower bed okay um, and she, she's worried about this because she has a small dog. She does. She just wants to make sure it's not hazardous. And how does she get rid of it? Yeah. So that um, it's a jelly fungi, also known as a wood ear. The scientific name is Auricularia. Um, but those are are pretty common um, on on a lot of wood as well, especially dead wood. You'll you'll find them all all the time. As far as um, them being poisonous, they're, 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 they'll be fine. They should be fine for the wiener dog. Um, I know that people eat them, not all the time, but, but fairly often. Just once. Just, <laughs> no, those are a mushroom that you can eat more than once. Okay. So, with peanut butter? With peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But, but yeah, I would uh, just, just let, them, let, let both, of those, both those be. All right, excellent. Thanks, Kyle. All right, this is Crawford County. Iowa near Denison, and they have an old, beautiful, healthy bur oak, 30-foot branch that is parallel to the ground, touches the ground when it leaves out or has snow on it. They wonder, should they cut it off or should they just let it be because it's so beautiful? Well, anytime we have a limb on there that's that large, I just go ahead and leave it on um, as long as possible. And I know that it's going to touch the ground when you have snow as long as it springs back up and as long as you're regularly checking to make sure there's no cracks or, or stress um, fractures or anything like that in there, that's going to be just um, fine for a while. So the thing to keep in mind when a tree is growing is the branches are always at that same location. Um, so when it's two foot off the ground, it doesn't matter if the tree is four foot tall or 20 foot tall, those branches are always going to be four foot off the ground. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking about removing a branch, it's best to do it when they're smaller in diameter. It's not as much stress to the tree. Ideally, we want two thirds canopy to one third trunk. And so with time, you want to try to limit up so that way you don't have those issues of clearance, especially over sidewalks or with this big tree, you know, you know it's going to be touching the ground here before too long once it gets bigger. Right. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. 
Well, of course, we are still waiting out the weather before we get started for real in our garden. We've had a very rainy week here in Lincoln, so most of our plants are still in the greenhouse. But let's take a minute to hear from Terry James out at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're probably doing what everybody else across the state is, watching the weather. We noticed on the extended forecast that another night here in Lincoln is going to get down to 37. So if we do have any plants that we have brought out of the greenhouse, we're going to make sure if it does get any colder, we're going to cover those. We're also watching the rain. The past two days here in Lincoln, we've had up to two inches of rain, lots of high winds. So we were out checking all of our plants to see any kind of hail damage, wind damage checked our trees and shrubs for any broken limbs. Um, some of our early blooming flowers kind of took it, um, didn't really fare very well. So we've lost some of those flowers, but those are early blooming and we'll get some new uh, summer stuff coming here soon. So just take your time, walk out through your landscape, just like we are, pull back that mulch that ran down the hill from all that heavy rain, cover the plants, bring them back into your garage if you've already taken them out and just keep checking the weather and stop by the backyard farmer garden and see what's going on. All that moisture hopefully will help those veggies and ornamentals get off to the right start without Phytophthora, Kyle. Hope so. <laughs> but obviously we can't really get more of them in the ground until that soil dries up and it sounds like maybe next week and it will be after Mother's Day and we say, up. you know, after Mother's Day is when we plant things out. All right, so tree issue. And this is a tree in Papillion that only has leaves on about 30 to 40% of its branches and it is an ash mm. and it is in Papillion. Okay. What do we suggest here, Jonathan? I would really recommend you contact an arborist to come out and take a look at that tree, see what's going on. Could be Emerald Ash Borer, Sarpy County, not too far away from some of those confirmed locations. So be something to check out for sure. Uh, if you're seeing a lot of that dieback, that, that is a little questionable for Emerald Ash Borer. So I would get an arborist out there to take a look at Or your local extension office would be happy to try and help as well. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, yeah. thanks, Jonathan. Let's see, this is, we don't know where this viewer is, Matt, but they took five pines removed out of the backyard. They wanna grow some turf. They wanna know how to get ready to grow turf where those pines were. All right, well, if you pull them out, you're gonna have a big hole there. So obviously you need to get topsoil and try and level it off to the surrounding area. That way, every time you're mowing, you don't have a dip and you're hitting a wheel in there. Uh, so that's the first step. And then anytime starting now, depending on what grass you have, you could ID it if it's Kentucky bluegrass or tall fescue, uh, you wanna make sure you buy the same seed or similar seed that way. When it does come back, you're not gonna have different colored circles in there, even though you still might just because of the variety differences. Uh, but if you get the same species, it's gonna help. Uh, so starting after you get the soil ready, uh, you wanna lightly uh, work it up after it's firmed up. And then you can either drop just basically for that small of an area, just sprinkle the seed, try and get about four seeds per square inch or more. Uh, maybe not quite that much if you're, uh, depending on what seed you're using, I guess, but it's, that's about the right, right number. Uh, and then you wanna make sure, for those small of areas, you could actually use a mulch or some sort of uh, straw. That way it's easier to keep them wet. And then water and fertilize those areas separately from the rest of the lawn and you should have a nice nice transition of grass from where it was trees. All right, excellent, thanks Matt. So Kyle, real quickly before we go to break, you mentioned the word Phytophthora. Yes. If you get a plant from the garden center that looks wilty like that, do not throw it in the compost pile? Correct, yeah. Um, that's one of those that will not, it'll survive the compost fairly well, unless, you, unless you're making sure to get it up to the 140 de, or 160 degrees three times per season, blah, 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 which no one does with their compost. Um, but yes, uh, do not throw that in the compost. I would just recommend um, burying it in a whole other part of the yard where you're not gonna do anything. All right, and Elizabeth, real quick, hail damage on hostas, leave the leaves or no? Leave as much of the green tissue as you possibly can, so that way it can photosynthesize and go back into the crown. Excellent. Yes. Almost. 
We have a person who has three river birch seedlings. Can she plant them together in the same spot to create a clump? You could, it's not gonna give you the same effect and they're gonna outcompete each other. All right, is it too late to divide daffodils? This is an Omaha viewer. You're a little early. And when should they be divided? Well, you wanna do it when the foliage starts to fade so you still know where the bulbs are, are at and then plant them two times the depth of the bulb. All right, um, so we have someone who has asked us about companion planting. What do we say about tomatoes love onions and those sorts of things? There's not the research backing behind the companion planting. All right, when do you remove the stakes from a new tree? It should not be left on for longer than a year. And if a person has removed the stakes and the tree is still like this in the hole, what does that really mean? That means it is not rooting out properly and you might wanna leave a stake lower to the ground just to hold that root ball in place. All right, we have a viewer who actually uh, found an old bag of fish emulsion and some worm castings in the garage. Are these good products to use in the garden? Use them up. Would I buy new ones? No. <laughs> Okay, so transplant good-looking apricots from small pots. How do we do that? Very, very carefully. <laughs> All right. Just give her the chance. Yeah. Well, that was a technical error on the part of you got more time than you were supposed to. <laughs> so, no, you're not going to get that trophy. Whoa! <laughs> oh. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, all right, Kyle, are you ready? Always. We have a, uh, a viewer who says they have Norway spruce, but it has no interior needles. Is that a disease? Um, probably not. A lot of evergreens do naturally drop their, their third or fourth four-year-old needles. All right, um, leaf spot on silky dogwood was discovered in a garden center in Omaha. Is that a concern? It depends how, how big the leaf spots are, how much there are. If it's just a couple, some, some really small ones, it's probably not, probably not a big concern. If they're all over the plant, then I, I would avoid it. All right, uh, anthracnose is an issue in sycamores oftentimes. Is it too late, too early, or we don't know? It's, uh, it's too late for to do anything with it. Anthracnose actually infects the sycamores as the, before the leaves are able to, uh, to leaf out. And so they're while they're still in the bud and a lot of our sycamores have already leafed out, so. We have a York viewer who has dark sunken spots on the canes of an old rose. Sounds like, uh, just sounds like a rose canker. I'd go ahead and prune it out. All right, when is hen of the woods ready to harvest and chomp on? Um, it's probably not ready yet. I'd wait, wait another couple of, um, couple of weeks. Middle of the summer typically is when, when I find my hens, hens of the woods. All right, excellent. Thank you. You ready, Matt? Yeah. I don't know if I'm gonna be at eight. But... <laughs> <laughs> hey, you don't have to, she's dq <laughs> So does a pre-merge work on bindweed or nutsedge? This is an Omaha viewer. Uh, on bindweed it would, because that's a seed. Nutsedge, tuber, too low. Most likely not. All right. Um, seed went down before the, a pre-merge was put down and it was one that did not have mesotrione in it. So what is the window for reseeding after a pre-merge uh, has gone down? Most labels state 60 to 90 days, but if you're tilling it up, you can generally get it a little sooner. All right. How can brome that's creeping in from a neighboring acreage be killed? This is a Geneva viewer. Uh, Roundup or mesotrione works with multiple applications. Okay, with the cold weather, a Holdridge viewer says their newly seeded lawn is only up by about one inch. Just wait Too and cold. See. Too cold, all right. Is buffalo grass sod available anywhere in Nebraska? Yes, Todd Valley, I believe, has sod and plugs. All right, um, Memorial Day is coming up. Is it time to fertilize by holiday? Uh, typically end of May be a good time. Close enough. You don't want to do it too early. It's going to hear me bail on it. <laughs> All right. Excellent. All right. You ready, Jonathan? I need to drink water. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so since you, uh, since, yeah, since we had an EAB question already with that ash, does Mancana Manchurian ash or any other ash resist EAB? 
Do the you? the Asian ash can uh, resist it. Yes, they grew up with it over in the Asiatic countries, so they can. All right. So will praying mantises stay around if they are hatched, or do they take off and go elsewhere? They can stick around, but they might take flight and go elsewhere. They don't want to compete with each other too much. All right. This is a Lincoln viewer who who uh, has grubs in their lawn, and they wonder, is it time to treat, and if so, with what? Yeah, you want to go out, maybe do a Scott's Grub X here around Mother's Day. All right. Uh, is it okay to use grub control in flower beds? Are there any reasons to or not to? Labels the law. If it's not on there, I wouldn't use it there. All right. This is a papillion viewer who found a big dead wolf spider in the basement. Is mm -hmm. this an odd time of year to find? Nope. Some of them can live for two years, especially the females. All right. This is a North Platte viewer who had wheel bugs last year. Mm -hmm. Expect them again? Absolutely, yeah. Wheel bugs are good to have around, too. All right. Uh, Earthworms versus redworms for compost. Uh, redworms are an earthworm, I would say, so it's probably kind of one, two, half dozen the other, but uh, it depends on what you're trying to do, I guess. There are some invasive earthworms we're concerned about, so maybe look that up and see what you're dealing with. Excellent, you thank you. Over. They're going to recalculate, by the way, <laughs> so do plan of the week, Elizabeth, and then we'll get back to our viewers on who wins that trophy. I'm always a winner. Um, <laughs> So what we have here is we have some very interesting flowers. And the first one we're gonna start with is this bright red one. And what it is, is it's a peony flowered tulip. So that's right, it is a tulip. Mm -hmm. um, it's double flowered. And this is a really fun one because it's a later flowering one too. And so that's really mm -hmm. good. Now, I know we've had some questions about tulips and not being long lived. Um, this is one of the ones, it lives about two to three years. And because it lives more than two years, yes, it's a perennial but it's gonna be a short-lived perennial. So that's one of them that's gonna live for a little while. Um, but if you want a longer lived one, you're gonna to have to go with some of the straight species. The other one that we have down here is the Lily of the Valley. And this one's really cool because it likes it in the shade. It like is tough as nails, uh, really nice ground cover, likes the dry shade can be slightly, it very aggressive, um, and the deer like it, so let the deer go ahead and graze it off. It's a very sweet smelling one. So if you have that spot in the shade where you just have room for the plant to just go ahead and do whatever it wants to do, Lily of Valley, tough as nails. If you wanna to try to get it out of there, it's gonna be one that you're gonna to have to work pretty hard to get it out, but two very, really nice plants. And go big red. Go big red. <laughs> Scarlet and cream. There we go. <laughs> All right. Your next pictures are, first off, a Lincoln viewer with Little Devil Nine Bark. Uh, it's been healthy. We did have Nine Bark originally, a little sample earlier in the season, but holy buckets worth of <laughs> something in the Nine Bark. Yeah, those look like dogwood borers, which are known to get into that Nine Bark. I remember that sample from earlier this season, mm -hmm. that picture. So. Uh, this is going to pupate soon and come out as a moth. This would be something you'd be spraying permethrin for or maybe bifenthrin, a pyrethroid type insecticide down the bark of the plant. That's usually a recommendation for dogwood. So just take a look at the plant, what's, whatever is left of it after those <clears throat> have gotten done with it. You can treat that outer layer of it with those products to try and prevent this from happening again. That would be done at the end of May. Okay, and you have a, a different viewer that has tree peonies, and this is a Fremont viewer, and a little hard to see in here, but she says there's a, a what appears to be a borer hole at the base, and the one shoot really is not doing well. When I looked at these, I really looked close. I'm not sure that I, I there's not a whole lot of evidence here. I'd love to see this more in person and see some of the other stuff that we've got going on here, and to see if we see any ants, because that first picture mm -hmm. with the little hole at the bottom, and there's like a pile of stuff outside of it, looks an awful lot like a carpenter ant problem. And carpenter ants, when I looked up tree peonies, there were a couple of people that talked about dealing with them in that particular plant. So that might be what you're dealing with there, or they may have moved on. Maybe the colony is dead now and you're just dealing with the aftermath. So keep a close eye out for big black ants. All right, excellent. Thanks, Jonathan. All right, this is a South of Hickman viewer, Matt, uh, has this unwanted turf in their lawn and really All sent right. us just a couple pictures that look kind of like this. So what do we think here? Um, good picture. Uh, I was able to zoom in and look at it and it looks like orchard grass because it's kind of got that flat um, leaf character or basically the, the shoot is kind of a flat and it also has uh, an, an auricle that sticks out that you can see kind of membraneous uh, right where the leaf comes out of the, the sheath there. 
Uh, so that's kind of a telltale sign of orchard grass, and it's typically, you know, it's a nuisance grass, and there's really no good control methods for it in turf. Uh, so the only way you can do it is either by pulling it out or by spot treating with Roundup. And I wouldn't recommend that because usually you kill a lot more grass than you want to. So if there's just a few here and there, uh, that'd be just pull those out. Uh, they don't spread by rhizomes, it's more by seed and they're more of a tillering. So they won't, they won't spread if you pull them out. All right, thanks Matt. All right, Kyle, uh, this is also peonies. Okay. for you and it's two different viewers the first is southwest nebraska these are on the west side of her house uh, one on each end of the row looks like this the ones in the middle look fine yeah that one's tough um not entirely sure what it is it does look like there's a rock bed underneath there um, and so whenever you have a rock mulch that can have unequal kind of heating and cooling periods. And when you have that, that heating and cooling, we can have an increase in anthocyanins, which are a red pigment in plants. And so that's one possibility. The other thing is that um, with peonies being perennial and the leaves cupping up, that we might be dealing with some sort of virus. So mm -hmm. if it's been, if you've been seeing it for a couple of years, um, I would assume it's a virus. If it's, this is the first time, then maybe it's environmental and it'll grow out of it. All right, and their second peony one, again, is a, you know, this one shoot on the peony apparently keeps doing this. Yeah, and this is one I'm really not sure. Um, could be a few different things. I would just need to see a sample um, actually in the, clinic, in the clinic for that one. All right, excellent. All right, Elizabeth, your question here is, this is a plasma viewer has dwarf Alberta spruce, seeing uh, some damage on this one. He thought maybe it was a fungus. So dwarf Alberta spruce are not my favorite for several reasons, but um, one of the reasons is, is because they have such little growth every year. So on the back side, what we had is we had some damage, um, whether it was spider mites, whether it was fungal, whether it was the heat off the building. Um, so you have that death in that spot. And sadly, because we have no growth in that spot, there's the potential there could be a hollow spot and that hollow spot is not going to fill back out like the rest of the tree. Mm -hmm. And so if you like the way the other side look, well, we just look at the other side and don't look at the bare spot on the back side. <laughs> um, but if you really don't like the way that bare spot looks, um, then we're probably gonna be talking about removal. Um, they're one of the favorites of spider mites. So, <laughs> you know, be on the lookout for spider mites because it is a little bit stressed on that one side. All right, thanks, Elizabeth. Well, we heard from John Porter a few weeks ago about starting tomato seeds indoors. He returns tonight to help us pick out growing plants in case your own at home did not sprout. There is a lot to consider from the size of the plant, determinate versus indeterminate, and days to harvest. So here's John to tell us more. Last time on the show, I talked about starting your tomatoes from seed indoors so you can get that perfect tomato for your garden. Maybe that didn't work out, maybe you don't have time to do that, or maybe you just forgot. So I'm here at the local garden center to pick out the tomato that's perfect for my garden and for your garden as well. There's lots of things to consider, and as you can see, we're in a sea of choices. So it's time to choose our own adventure when it comes to tomatoes and pick the right one that's the best choice for our garden. So one of the first choices that you have to make is the type of tomato that you want to grow fruit-wise because that is dependent on what you want to use the fruit for. So if you're looking for a nice slicer for a BLT, you want a slicing type tomato. There's lots of different ones, some common ones. You have those Beef Master, Big Beef, Celebrity. Those are slicers that you can put on the sandwich. If you're looking for something to make a salsa or to can with, you're gonna want a sauce or a paste type tomato like Aroma. And those are a different type of tomato that you will use. And it's, they have less liquid in them so that you can can them more efficiently. Then if you're looking for salad type tomatoes, there's cherries and grapes. We have all of these uh, cherry and grapes here in the area. And those are the small little tomatoes that you can pop onto a salad uh, easy peasy uh, and not have to slice them up. Now the second choice that you have to look at is the growth habit of the tomato. So we have indeterminates and determinates. A determinate on the label means that it's a bush type tomato and it doesn't grow very tall. Uh, and it's, very, it's much easier to grow than the vining type tomato, the indeterminate. And those are the ones that you see that just keep growing and growing and you have to stake up. 
The nice thing is that they keep producing throughout the season, unlike the determinants, but you do have to keep them under control. Now these days you can even find some other types of tomatoes. There are dwarf tomatoes that are meant for containers. They're very small and compact and you can still get a good harvest from them even though they're a small plant. And now we even have grafted tomatoes. So those grafted tomatoes have been added onto a new rootstock. Let's say we have an heirloom variety which has a little bit more disease problems than the, the hybrid varieties. We add those onto a hybrid rootstock that adds some disease resistance. So we have all of those different types of tomatoes and those are the different types of choices that you have to look at whenever you're in the sea of tomatoes. Hey there, I just have these few tomatoes today. So if you remember, we talked about picking the right tomato for how you wanna use it, whether or not it's a slicer or a canner, you pick that type of fruit out for your use. We also talked about picking out the type of growth habit of the tomato, those indeterminate viney ones, the determinate bushy ones, or even those dwarf ones for the containers. And we also talked about trying something new. There's those grafted tomatoes that are out these days that have all kinds of fun functions, including adding disease resistance to those heirlooms that don't have those disease resistance. So pick out those right tomatoes for you. You can choose your own adventure in the sea of tomatoes at your local garden center. Hopefully that sorts out any mysteries you might have when you're thinking about going to the garden center to pick those plants and we'll hear from John again soon about getting those tomato plants in the ground. All right and if you already have them in the ground by the way cover them <laughs> for frost. All right Jonathan this is a Dodge County viewer with a 15 year old riparian buffer. Mm -hmm. So floodplain buffer. He thinks this is an ash. He thinks it's dead. Of course, he wonders, is this emerald ash borer? It is not. Okay. Do I get an extra point for the lightning round? <laughs> 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 uh, no, this is some sort of cerambicid, some sort of longhorn borer. When we look at the damage left behind by EAB, it's much less meandering than what we see with this particular borer. I did bring one here tonight if we want to. Mm -hmm. zoom in on some of the serpentine-like galleries that they leave behind. So it's much tighter, starts out smaller. You can see the insect get bigger and bigger until we reach the top here, and then that's its D-shaped exit hole that it leaves behind. So All that right. other one is not emerald ash borer. Right, excellent, good to know. Good to know. All right, Matt, this is a viewer in Shadron, planted buffalo grass in its bowie last June 15th. Um, apparently we have a little marital difference of opinion here on whether this is a good stand. And the question is, if they leave it alone, will it eventually take over and, and push, out the, uh, push out the cool seasons and the weeds? Yeah, I think it's a fairly good stand. June 15th was getting probably on the little bit later side, and then their winter just kind of came really quick, so it didn't have a lot of time to fill in. Uh, but there's enough there, and I would say that it's going to fill in once, whenever we warm up. It's still pretty cold. Buffalo grass is still coming out of dormancy. Uh, so when it does green up, probably here in the next couple weeks, uh, it might be beneficial to hit it with a fertilizer. And that way you can push it along and get it to uh, shoot out more stolons, and it'll cover quicker. All right. Thanks, Matt. All right. So, Kyle, you have a couple of white foamy trees. Okay. <laughs> and the first white foamy tree is, what is this white foamy stuff in this tree? And I think this is an autumn purple ash. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm hard to say for sure without actually seeing something, something in the lab. But to me, that looks like slime flux, um, mm -hmm. which is just a white foamy substance that will come out of, come out of uh, trees as they're as they're warming up in the spring and um, as there's a lot of uh, nutrient and water flow from the, from the roots up through the, through the top. All right, and your second one is uh, scotch pine and whether this is actually insect or pathological. Yeah, that could be a canker. Um, pines do get some cankers that have that white pitch. Cytospora is one of them, but otherwise it kind of looks to me like a Zimmerman moth yeah, we damage. Yeah, we get that popcorn-like stuff that comes out of the tree with Zimmerman pine moth, I would agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that would be a permethrin spray here towards right now, like mm -hmm. today or like tomorrow. Today. Yeah, yeah, get out there and try get and out there and that do tree. It. Yeah. Okay, all right, thanks guys. All right, so Elizabeth, um, we actually talked about lightning <laughs> and we have a viewer who sent us a couple of pictures of lightning strike on a tree and what it does. And his comment on this was actually this is what it did, and I think the second one shows 
that it skipped and blew a hole in the ground. And, and the reason we're doing this is our next picture is a split and happens to be in smoke tree, all the canes are cracked and people always are asking, all right, what is this crack, whether it's an ash or a maple or a smoke tree? So more than likely the smoke tree wasn't hit by lightning, right? Um, just because it's a smaller tree and it's probably not going to be the first thing to get hit by lightning. What we see with the lightning is it goes in in one spot and then it goes out in another spot right. and oftentimes we'll see that bark blow off um, and sometimes we'll see that tree kind of limp along for a while and so more than likely with the smoke tree we're looking at removal and replacement with that one just because it's not going to seal back over and, and um, you know, heal itself and be a, a good tree down the line. So it's one of those where we're probably either looking at, you know, cutting it off on the ground and seeing if we get something to come back up and turn it into more like a bush, right. or we just start over. Right, lots of that winter mm -hmm. serious cracking going on. All right, thanks. Well, we have, of course, a lot of announcements of cool things going on in the gardening world. Nebraska Daylily Society Bear Root Daylily Sale is Saturday the 11th at Lawrence and Gardens in Omaha from nine to four. Our next announcement is Planting Time Always Garden Club Annual Sale, also Saturday in Carter Lake, so you can be Omaha side and then Carter Lake side. Our next one is the Arboretum Plant Sale on East Campus, Saturday the 11th, um, and that is actually at the Greenhouses, and 102 Kime Hall is a good location. Tremendous celebration in Maxwell Arboretum is Thursday, May 16th at the Perrin Porch here on East Campus as well. That's always a good fun time. And then, of course, digging deeper with Backyard Farmer. We uh, debuted that last weekend. We're really excited to tell you about this week's topic, which just happens to be emerald ash borer slowly making its way west. That is the focus of this week's show. We will be talking with our own entomologist, Jonathan Larson, <laughs> as well as Dave Olson, who is a forest health specialist from the Nebraska Forest Service, state entomologist Julie Van Meter. So a panel of three on that one. Do be sure to watch Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer on NET's Facebook page this Sunday at 6.30 p.m. Central. And last week, of course, there was that tornado thing going on in Lincoln, <laughs> but probably this week the weather will be good. Yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> All right, so just regular old questions here for a little bit. Uh, this is a Cambridge, Nebraska viewer, um, southwest Nebraska. Terrible problem with lumps, bumps, and earthworms in the lawn. Mm. So what do we do about earthworms in the lawn. Yeah, Matt, what do we do? Uh, <laughs> uh, earthworms are hard to treat for because there's nothing really labeled for them. There's not a lot right. of vermicides actually on the market for them. You're probably seeing the middens, maybe the castings. If it's a midden, it's maybe a night crawler and those are really hard to deal with. Uh, there's nothing labeled. There is one thing called early bird fertilizer. If you get a professional that has access to that, they can treat your lawn with it. It's a fertilizer, chicken manure mixed with tea seed and that tea seed has got soaps in it that destroy some of the earthworms. That would be one option. Okay. Yeah. And then, there's not a lot I, of other I ones. don't know, just fertilizing in general helps, I think, too, yeah. a little bit. Urea, some, you mentioned Yeah, before. urea, yeah. yep. Will help drive I mean, them the, down. I would look away. into it a little more, but I haven't, there's a chance that'll help a little bit, too. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs> so uh, this is an Omaha viewer who is still dealing with salt damage to the lawn against those edges. What do we do now in the in the seating window? Now we're, I mean, we're just hoping that it kind of flushes out when the rains we get, or a little bit more irrigation in just those spots. I mean, let's say a hose, try and flush that out, and then you're probably gonna have to introduce new seed. And over time, the salt should dissipate and grass will grow back in there, but it might not be right away. All right, thanks, Matt. This is our first uh, question, Kyle, in about 50 seconds or less. Okay. Uh, unflowering pear gets rust in late spring, looks awful the rest of the summer. What can they spray with and when? So now would actually be about the um, great time to spray. Um, similar to the cedar apple rust that we saw earlier, um, that's one of those rusts that will uh, move to alternate, move, move with a few different hosts. So uh, um, some pr uh, propiconazole or captan would be some products that I would use. All right. And Elizabeth, you're getting questions now about flooded asparagus. Flooded asparagus and flooded rhubarb. Um, like we've said in the past, 120 days from when the flood mm -hmm. waters receded to when it's safe to go ahead and eat. So we're talking July and we really don't want to be picking much until that point in time. We want to try to recharge the crown. All right. And so those of you who wonder who won the lightning round because we had a little bit of a time thing, it was not Elizabeth. <laughs> 
it was Jonathan. They looked at the monitor and it was Jonathan. So Jonathan, you get that trophy. I'll split it with Elizabeth. <laughs>